Human Inability by C.H. Spurgeon, read by 95 Theses, t.me forward slash every creature ministry. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. John 6, 44. Coming to Christ is a very common phrase in the Holy Scripture. It's used to express those acts of the soul wherein, leaving at once our self-righteousness and our sins, we fly unto the Lord Jesus Christ and receive His righteousness to be our covering and His blood to be our atonement. Coming to Christ, then, embraces in it repentance, self-negation, and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and it sums within itself all those things which are necessary attendants of these great states of heart, such as the belief of the truth, earnestness of prayer to God, the submission of the soul to the precepts of God's gospel, and all those things which accompany the dawn of salvation in the soul. Coming to Christ is just the one essential thing for a sinner's salvation. He that cometh not to Christ, do what he may, or think what he may, is yet in the gall of bitterness and in the bonds of iniquity. Coming to Christ is the very first effect of regeneration. No sooner is the soul quickened than it at once discovers its lost estate. It's horrified thereat. It looks out for a refuge and, believing Christ to be a suitable one, flies to him and reposes in him. Where there is not this coming to Christ, it is certain that there is yet no quickening. When there is no quickening, the soul is dead in trespasses and sins, and being dead, it cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. We have before us now an announcement very startling, some say very obnoxious. Coming to Christ, though described by some people as being the very easiest thing in all of the world, is in our text declared to be a thing utterly and entirely impossible to any man, unless the Father shall draw him to Christ. It shall be our business, then, to enlarge upon this declaration. We doubt not that it will always be offensive to carnal nature. But nevertheless, the offending of human nature is sometimes the first step towards bringing it to bow itself before God. And if this be the effect of a painful process, we can forget the pain and rejoice in the glorious consequences. I shall endeavor this morning, first of all, to notice man's inability, wherein it consists. Secondly, the Father's drawings, what these are, how they are exerted upon the soul. And then I shall conclude by noticing a sweet consolation which may be derived from this seemingly barren and terrible text. 1. First, then, man's inability. The text says, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. Wherein does this inability lie? First, it does not lie in any physical defect. If in coming to Christ, moving the body or walking with our feet should be of any assistance, certainly man has all physical power to come to Christ in that sense. I remember to have heard very foolish antinomian declare that he did not believe any man had the power to walk to the house of God unless the Father drew him. Now the man was plainly foolish because he must have seen that as long as a man was alive and had legs, it was an easy walk for him to the house of God as to the house of Satan. If coming to Christ includes the utterance of prayer, man has no physical defect in that respect. If he be not dumb, if he can say a prayer as easily as he can utter blasphemy, it's easy for a man to sing one of the songs of Zion as to sing a profane and libidious song. There's no lack of physical power in coming to Christ. All that can be wanted with regard to the bodily strength man most assuredly has. And any part of salvation which consists in that is totally and entirely in the power of man without any assistance from the Spirit of God, nor again does this inability lie in any mental lack. I can believe this Bible to be true just as easily as I can believe any other book to be true. So far as believing Christ is an act of the mind, I am just as able to believe on Christ as I am able to believe on anybody else. Let his statement be but true. It is idle to tell me I cannot believe it. I can believe the statement that Christ makes as well as I can believe the statement of any other person. There is no deficiency or faculty of the mind. 
it is as capable of appreciating as a mere mental act the guilt of sin as it is of appreciating the guilt of assassination. It is just as possible for me to exercise the mental idea of seeking God as it is to exercise the thought of ambition. I have all the mental strength and power that can possibly be needed, as far as mental power is needed in salvation at all. Nay, there is not any man so ignorant that he can plead a lack of intellect as an excuse for rejecting the gospel. The defect, then, does not lie either in the body or what we are bound to call, speaking theologically, the mind. It's not in any lack or deficiency there, although it is this vitiation of the mind the corruption and the ruin of it, which, after all, is the very essence of man's inability. Permit me to show you wherein this inability of man really does lie. It lies deep in his nature. Through the fall and through our own sin, the nature of man has become so debased and depraved and corrupt that it is impossible for him to come to Christ without the assistance of God and the Holy Spirit. Now, in trying to exhibit how the nature of man thus renders him unable to come to Christ, you must allow me just to take this figure. You see a sheep, how willingly it feeds upon the herbage. You never knew a sheep sigh after carrion. It could not live on lion's food. Now bring me a wolf, and you ask me whether a wolf can eat grass, whether it cannot be just as docile and domesticated as the sheep, and I answer, no, because its nature is contrary thereto. You say, well, it has ears and legs. Can it not hear the shepherd's voice and follow him whithersoever it leadeth it? I answer, certainly. There's no physical cause why it cannot do so, but its nature forbids it. And therefore, I say it cannot do so. Can it not be tamed? Can its furiosity be removed? Probably it may so far be subdued that it may become apparently tame, but there will always be a marked distinction between it and the sheep, because there is a distinction in its nature. Now the reason why man cannot come to Christ is not because he cannot come so far as his body or the mere power of his mind is concerned, but because his nature is so corrupt that he has neither the will nor the power to come to Christ unless drawn by the Spirit. Let me give you better illustrations. You see a mother with her babe in her arms. You put a knife into her hand and tell her to stab that babe to the heart. She replies, and very truthfully, I cannot. Now as far as her bodily power is concerned, she can, if she pleases. There's the knife. There's the child. The child cannot resist. She has quite sufficient strength in her hand immediately to stab it through its heart. But she is quite correct when she says she cannot do it. As a mere act of the mind, it's quite possible she might think as such a thing of killing the child, but she says she cannot think of such a thing. And she does not say this falsely, for her nature as a mother forbids her doing a thing from which her soul revolts, simply because she is that child's parent. She feels she cannot kill it. It's even so with the sinner. Coming to Christ is so obnoxious to human nature that although as far as physical and mental forces are concerned, and these have but very narrow sphere in salvation, men could come if they would. It is strictly correct to say that they cannot and will not unless the Father who has sent Christ doth draw them. Let us enter a little more deeply into this subject and try to show you wherein this inability of man consists in its more minute particulars. 1. First, it lies in the obstinacy of the human will. O, oh, saith the Arminian, men may be saved if they will. We reply, my dear sir, we all believe that. But it's just that if they will, that is the difficulty. We assert that no man will come to Christ unless he be drawn. Nay, we do not assert it, but Christ himself declares it. Ye will not come unto me that you might have life. As long as that ye will not come stands on record in Holy Scripture, we shall not be brought to believe in any doctrine of the freedom of the human will. It is strange how people, 
and talking about free will, talk of things which they do not at all understand. Now, says one, I believe men can be saved if they will. My dear sir, that's not the question at all. The question is, are men ever found naturally willing to submit to the humbling terms of the gospel of Christ? We declare upon scriptural authority that the human will is so desperately set on mischief, so depraved, so inclined to everything that is evil, so disinclined to everything that is good, and that without the powerful, supernatural, irresistible influence of the Holy Spirit, no human will ever be constrained toward Christ. You reply, Men are sometimes willing without the help of the Holy Spirit. I answer, Did you ever meet with any person who was? Scores and hundreds? Nay, thousands of Christians have I conversed with of different opinions, young and old. It's never been my lot to meet with one who could affirm that he came to Christ by himself without being drawn. The universal confession of all true believers is this. I know that unless Jesus Christ had sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God, I would to this very hour have been wandering far from him, at a distance from him, and loving that distance well. With common consent, all believers affirm the truth that men will not come to Christ till the Father who has sent Christ doth draw them. Two, again, not only is the will obstinate, but the understanding is darkened. Of that we have abundant scriptural proof. I am not now making mere assertions, but stating doctrines authoritatively taught in the Holy Scripture, and known in the consequence of every Christian man, that the understanding of man is so dark that he cannot by any means understand the things of God until his understanding has been opened. Man is by nature blind within. The cross of Christ, so laden with glories and glittering with attraction, never attracts him. But he is blind. He cannot see its beauties. Talk to him of the wonders of creation. Show him the many colored arches that span the sky. Let him behold the glories of a landscape. He is well able to see all these things, but talk to him of the wonders of the covenant of grace. Speak to him of the security of the believer in Christ. Tell him of the beauties of the person, the Redeemer. He's quite deaf to all your description. You are as one that playeth a goodly tune, it is true, but he regards it not. He's deaf. He has no comprehension, or to return to the verse, which we are specially marked in our reading, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And inasmuch as he is a natural man, it is not in his power to discern the things of God. Well, says one, I think I have arrived at a very tolerable judgment in the matters of theology. I think I understand almost every point. True, that you may do in the letter of it, but in the spirit of it, in the true reception thereof into the soul, in the actual understanding of it, it is impossible for you to have attained unless you have been drawn by the Spirit. For as long as that scripture stands true, that carnal man cannot receive spiritual things, it must be true that you have not received them unless you've been renewed and made a spiritual man in Christ Jesus. The will, then, and the understanding are two great doors, both blocked up against our coming to Christ. And until these be opened by the sweet influences of the divine spirit, they must be forever closed to anything like coming to Christ. Three, again, the affections, which constitute a great part of the man, are depraved. Man, as he is, before he receives the grace of God, loves anything and everything above spiritual things. If you want proof of this, look around you. There needs no monument to the depravity of the human affections. Cast your eyes everywhere. There's not a street nor a house, nay, not a heart, which does not bear upon it the evidence of this dreadful truth. Why is it that men are not found on the Sabbath day universally flocking to the house of God? Why are we not more constantly found reading our Bibles? How is it that prayer is a duty of almost universally neglected? Why is it that Christ Jesus is so little loved? Why are even his professed followers so cold in their affections to him? Wherein arises these things? Assuredly, dear brethren, 
we can trace them to no other source than this, the corruption and vitiation of its affections. We love that which we ought to hate. We hate that which we ought to love. It is but human nature, fallen human nature, that man should love this present life better than the life to come. It is but the effect of the fall that man should love sin better than righteousness and the ways of the world better than the ways of God. And again, we repeat it, until these affections be renewed and turned into a fresh channel by the gracious drawings of the Father, it's not possible for any man to love the Lord Jesus Christ. For, yet once more, conscience, too, it's been overpowered by the fall. I believe there's no more egregious mistake made by the divines than when they tell people the conscience is the vice regent of God within the soul, and that it is one of those powers which retains its ancient dignity and stands erect amidst the fall of its compeers. My brethren, when man fell in the garden, manhood fell entirely. There was not one single pillar in the temple of manhood that stood erect. It is true, conscience was not destroyed, the pillar was not shattered, it fell, and it fell in one piece. And there it lies, the mightiest remnant of God's once perfect work in man. But the conscience is fallen, I'm sure. Look at the men who among them is the possessor of a good conscience toward God, but the regenerated man. Do you imagine that if man's conscience always spoke loudly and clearly to them, they would live in the daily commission of acts, which are as opposed to the right as darkness to light? No, beloved. Conscience can tell me that I'm a sinner, but conscience cannot make me feel that I am one. Conscience may tell me that such and such is a thing that is wrong, but how wrong is it conscience itself does not know? Did any man's conscience, unenlightened by the Spirit, ever tell him that his sins deserve damnation? Or if his conscience did do that, did it ever lead any man to feel an abhorrence of sin as sin? In fact, did conscience ever bring a man to such a self-renunciation that he did totally abhor himself and all his works and come to Christ? No. Conscience, although it's not dead, is ruined. Its power is impaired. It is not the clear clearness of an eye and the strength of the hand and that thunder of voice which it once had before the fall. But it ceased to a great degree to exert its supremacy in the town of man's soul. Then, beloved, it becomes necessary for this very reason, because conscience is depraved, that the Holy Spirit should step in and show us our need of a Savior and draw us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Still, says one, as far as you have hitherto gone, it appears to me that you consider that the reason why men do not come to Christ is that they will not, rather than they cannot. True, most true. I believe the greatest reason of man's inability is the obstinacy of his will, that once overcome, I think that great stone is rolled away from the sepulcher, and the hardest part of the battle is already won. But allow me to go a little further. My text does not say, no man will come, but it says, no man can come. Now many interpreters believe that he can here is but a strong expression conveying no more meaning than the word will. I feel assured that this is not correct. There is in man not only unwillingness to be saved, but there is a spiritual powerlessness to come to Christ. And this I will prove to every Christian at any rate. Beloved, I speak to you who have already been quickened by the divine grace. Does not your experience teach you that there are times when you have a will to serve God and you, you have not the power? Have you not sometimes been obliged to say that you've wished to believe, but you've had to pray, Lord, help mine unbelief? Because, although willing enough to receive God's testimony, your own carnal nature was too strong for you, and you felt you needed supernatural help. Are you able to go into your room at any hour you choose, and fall upon your knees and say, Now, it is my will that I should draw and be in earnest prayer, that I should draw near to God. I ask, do you find your power equal to your will? You could say, even at the bar of God himself, that you are sure you're not mistaken in your willingness. You're willing to be wrapped up in devotion. 
It is your will that your soul should not wander from a pure contemplation of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you find you cannot do that, even when you're willing, without the help of the Spirit. Now, if the quickened child of God finds spiritual inability, how much more the sinner who's dead in trespasses and sins? If even the advanced Christian, after 30 or 40 years, finds himself sometimes willing but yet powerless, if such be his experience, does it not seem then likely that the poor sinner who has not yet believed should find a need of strength as well as a want of will? But again, there's another argument. If the sinner has strength to come to Christ, I should like to know how we are to understand those continual descriptions of the sinner's state which we meet with in God's holy word. Now a sinner is said to be dead in trespasses and sins. Will you affirm that death implies nothing more than the absence of will? Such a corpse is quite unable and unwilling. Or again, do not all men see that there is a distinction between the will and power? Might not that corpse be sufficiently quickened to get a will? and yet be so powerless that it cannot lift itself or as much of a hand or a foot? Have we never seen cases in which persons have been so sufficiently reanimated to give evidence of life and have yet been so near death that they could not have performed the slightest action? If there is not a clear difference between the giving or the will or the giving of power, it's quite certain, however, that where the will is given, the power will follow. Make a man willing and he shall be made powerful. For when God gives the will, he does not tantalize man by giving him to wish for that which he is unable to do. Nevertheless, he makes such a division between the will and the power, and that it shall be seen that both things are quite distinct gifts of the Lord God. Then I must ask one more question. If all that were needed to make a man willing, do you not at once degrade the Holy Spirit? Are we not in the habit of giving all the glory of salvation wrought in us to God's Spirit? But now, if all that God the Spirit does for me is to make me willing to do those things for myself, am I not in the great measure a sharer with the Holy Spirit in the glory? May I not boldly stand up and say, It is true the Spirit gave me the will to do it, but still I did it myself, and therein will I glory. For if I did these things myself without assistance from on high, I will not cast my crown at his feet. It's my crown. I earned it. I will keep it. Inasmuch as the Holy Spirit is evermore in Scripture, set forth as the person who works in us to will and to do of his own good pleasure, we hold it to be a legitimate inference that he must do something more for us than the mere making us willing, and that, therefore, there must be another thing besides want of will in the sinner. There must be absolute and actual want of power. Now before I leave this statement, let me address myself to you for a moment. I'm often charged with preaching doctrines that may do a great deal of hurt. Well, I shall not deny that charge. I'm not careful to answer in this matter. I have my witnesses here present to prove that the things which I have preached have done a great deal of hurt, but they've not done hurt either to morality or to God's church. The hurt has been on the side of Satan. They're not the ones or twos, but many hundreds who this morning rejoice that they've been brought near to God, from having been profane Sabbath breakers, drunkards, and worldly persons, that they've been brought to know the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if there be any hurt, May God, of his infinite mercy, send us thousand times as much. But further, what truth is there in this world which will not hurt a man who chooses to make hurt of it? You who preach general redemption, you're very fond of proclaiming the great truth of God's mercy to the last moment. But how dare you preach that? Many people make hurt of it by putting off the day of grace and thinking that their last hour they may do as well as at the first. Why? If we never preached anything which man could misuse and abuse, we must hold our tongues forever. Still says one, Well then, if I cannot save myself and cannot come to Christ, I must sit still and do nothing. If men do say so, on their own heads shall be their doom. We very plainly told you there are many things you can do. To be found continually in the house of God 
is in your power. To study the Word of God with diligence is in your power. To renounce your outward sin, to forsake your vices in which you indulge, to make your life honest, sober, and righteousness, it is in your power. But this you need no help from the Holy Spirit. All this you can do for yourself. But to come to Christ truly is not in your power until you're renewed by the Holy Ghost. But mark you, your want of power is no excuse. Seeing you have no desire to come, and you're living in willful rebellion against God, you want, and your want of power lies mainly in the obstinacy of your nature. Suppose a liar says, it's not in his power to speak the truth. It has been a liar so long, he cannot leave it off. Is that an excuse for him? Suppose a man who has long indulged in lust should tell you that he finds his lusts have so girt about him like a great iron net that he cannot get rid of them. Would you take that as an excuse? Truly, it's none at all. If a drunkard has become so foully a drunkard that he finds it impossible to pass a public house without stepping in, do you therefore excuse him? No, because his inability to reform lies in his nature, which he has no desire to restrain or conquer. The thing that is done, the thing that causes the thing that is done, being both of the root of sin, are two evils which cannot excuse each other. What though the Ethiopian cannot change his skin, nor the leopard his spots, it is because you have learned to do evil that you cannot now learn to do well. And instead, therefore, of letting you sit down to excuse yourselves, let me put a thunderbolt between the seat of your sloth that you may be startled by it and aroused. Remember, to sit still is to be damned for all eternity. Oh, that God the Holy Spirit might make use of this truth in a very different manner. Before I've done, I trust I shall be enabled to show you how it is that this truth, which apparently condemns men and shuts them out, is after all the great truth which has been blessed to the conversion of men. Our second point is the Father's drawings. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. How then does the Father draw men? Arminian divines generally say that God draws men by the preaching of the gospel. Very true. The preaching of the gospel is the instrument of drawing men. But there must be something more than this. Let me ask to whom did Christ address these words? Why, to the people of Capernaum where he often preached, where he uttered mournfully and plaintively the woes of the law and the invitations of the gospel. In that city he did so many mighty works and worked many miracles. In fact, such teaching and such miraculous attestation had he given to them that he declared that Tyre and Sidon would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes if they'd been blessed with such privileges. Now, if the preaching of Christ himself did not avail to the enabling of these men to come to Christ, it cannot be possible that all that was intended by the drawing of the Father was simply preaching. No. Brethren, you must note again, he does not say no man can come except the minister draw him, but except the Father draw him. Now there is such a thing as being drawn by the gospel and drawn by the minister without being drawn by God. Clearly, it is a divine drawing that is meant, a drawing by the Most High God. The first person of the most glorious trinity sending out the third person, the Holy Spirit, to induce men to come to Christ. Another person turns round and says with a sneer, Then do you think that Christ drags men to himself, seeing that they are unwilling? I remember meeting once with a man who said to me, Sir, you preach that Christ takes people by the hair of their heads and drags them to himself. I asked him whether he could refer to the date of this sermon wherein I preached that extraordinary doctrine. For if he could, I should be very much obliged. However, he could not. But, said I, while Christ does not drag people to himself by the hair of their heads, I believe that he draws them by the heart quite as powerfully as this caricature would suggest. Mark that in the Father's drawing there is no compulsion whatever. Christ never compelled any man to come to him against his will. If a man be unwilling to be saved, Christ does not save him against his will. How, 
Then does this Holy Spirit draw him? Why, by making him willing. It is true he does not use moral suasion. He knows the nearer method of reaching the heart. He goes to the secret fountain of the heart. He knows how, by some mysterious operation, to turn the will in an opposite direction, so that, as Ralph Exon paradoxically put it, the man is saved with full consent against his will. That is, against his old will, he's saved. But he's saved with full consent, for he's made willing in the day of God's power. Do not imagine that any man will go to heaven kicking and struggling all the way against by the hand that draws him. Do not conceive that any man will be plunged into the bath of the Savior's blood while he is striving to run away from the Savior. Oh no. It's quite true that first of all man is unwilling to be saved. When the Holy Spirit has put his influence into the heart, the text is fulfilled. Draw me, and I will run after thee. We follow on while he draws us, glad to obey the voice which once we despised. But the gist of the matter, it lies in the turning of the will. How that is done no flesh knows, perceived as a fact, but the cause of which no tongue can tell and no heart can guess. The apparent way, however, in which the Holy Spirit operates, we can tell you the first thing the Holy Spirit does when he comes into a man's heart is this. He finds him with a very good opinion of himself. And there's nothing which prevents a man from coming to Christ like a good opinion of himself. Why, says the man, I don't want to come to Christ. I have as good a righteousness as anybody. I feel I can walk into heaven on my own right. The Holy Spirit lays bare his heart, lets him see the loathsome cancer that is there eating away his life, uncovers to him all the blackness and defilements of that stink of hell. The human heart... And then the man stands aghast. I never thought I was like this. Oh, those sins I thought were little have swelled out to an immense stature. What I thought was a molehill has grown into a mountain. It was but the hyssop of the wall before, but now it's become the cedar of Lebanon. Oh, saith the man within himself, I will try and reform. I will do good deeds enough to wash these black deeds out. Then comes the Holy Spirit and shows him that he cannot do this. It takes away all his fancied power and strength, so that the man falls down on his knees in agony and cries, Oh, once I thought I could save myself by my good works, but now I find that could my tears forever flow, could my zeal no respite know, all for sin could not atone, thou must save, and thou alone. Then the heart sinks. The man is ready to despair, and saith he, I can never be saved. Nothing can save me. Then comes the Holy Spirit and shows the sinner the cross of Christ, gives him eyes anointed with heavenly eye salve, and says, Look to yonder cross. That man, he died to save sinners. You feel you are a sinner. He died to save you. And he enables the heart to believe and to come to Christ. And when it comes to Christ, by this sweet drawing of the Spirit, it finds a peace with God which passes all understanding, which keepeth his heart and mind through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now you will plainly perceive that all this may be done without any compulsion. Man is as much drawing willingly as if he were not drawn at all. And he comes to Christ with full consent. And with as full a consent as if no secret influence had ever been exercised on his heart. But that influence must be exercised. Or else there never has been, there never will be any man who either can or will come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And three, now we gather up our ends. Conclude by trying to make a practical application of the doctrine and we trust a comfortable one. Well, says one, if what this man preaches be true, what is to become of my religion? For do you know I've been a long while trying, and I do not like to hear you say a man cannot save himself. I believe he can, and I mean to persevere. But if I am to believe what you say, 
I must give it all up and begin again. My dear friend, it will be a very happy thing if you do. Do not think that I shall be at all ashamed if you do. Remember, what you are doing is building your house upon the sand. It's but an act of charity if I can shake it a little for you. Let me assure you in God's name, if your religion has no better foundation than your own strength, it will not stand you at the bar of God. Nothing will last to eternity but that which has come from eternity. Unless the everlasting God has done a good work in your heart, all you may have done must be unraveled at the last day of account. It is all in vain for you to be a church-goer, a chapel-goer, a good keeper of the Sabbath, an observer of your prayers. It's all in vain for you to be honest to your neighbors and reputable in your conversations. If you hope to be saved by these things, it is all in vain for you to trust in them. Go on. Be as honest as you like. Keep the Sabbath perpetually. Be as holy as you can. I will not dissuade you from these things. God forbid, grow in them. But oh, do not trust in them. For if you rely upon these things, you will find they will fail you when you most need them. And if there be anything else that you have found yourself able to do unassisted by divine grace, the sooner you can get rid of that hope and that has been engendered by it, it's better for you. For it is a foul delusion to rely upon anything the flesh can do. A spiritual heaven must be inhabited by spiritual men, and preparation for it must be wrought by the Spirit of God. Well, cries another, I've been sitting under a ministry where I've been told that I could, at my own option, repent and believe, and the consequence is that I've been putting it off from day to day. I thought I could come one day as well as another, and that I had only to say, Lord, have mercy upon me and believe and then I should be saved. Now you've taken all this hope away from me, sir. I feel amazement and horror taking hold upon me. Again I say, my dear friend, I am very glad of it. This was the effect which I hoped to produce. I pray that you may feel this a great deal more. When you have no hope in saving yourself, I shall have hope that God has begun to save you. As soon as you say, oh, I cannot come to Christ, Lord, draw me, help me, I will rejoice over you. He who has got a will, though he has not the power, has grace begun in his heart. And God will not leave him until that work is finished. But careless sinner, learn that thy salvation now hangs in God's hand. And remember, you are entirely in the hand of God. You have sinned against him, and if he wills to damn you, damned you art. Thou canst not resist his will nor thwart his purpose. Thou hast deserved his wrath, and if he chooses to pour the full shower of his wrath upon thy head, thou canst do nothing to avert it. If, on the other hand, he chooses to save you, he's able to save you to the very uttermost. But thou liest as much in the hand of the summer's moth beneath thine own finger. He is the God whom thou art grieving every day. Does it not make you tremble to think that Thy eternal destiny now hangs upon the will of him whom thou hast angered and incensed. Does not this make your knees knock together and your blood curdle? If it does, I rejoice, inasmuch as this may be the first effect of the Spirit's drawing upon your soul. O oh, tremble to think, God, whom you have angered, is the God upon whom your salvation and your condemnation entirely depends. Tremble and kiss the sun, lest he be angry, and you perish from the way, while his wrath is kindled but a little. Now the comfortable reflection is this. Some of you this morning are conscious that you're coming to Christ. Have you not begun to weep, this penitential tear? Does not your closet witness your prayerful preparations for the hearing of the word of God? And during the service of this morning, has not your heart said within you, Lord, save me or I perish, for save myself I cannot. And could you not now stand up in your seat and sing, O oh, sovereign grace, my heart subdue, I would be led in triumph too, a willing captive of my Lord to sing the triumph of his word. 
And have I not myself heard you say in your heart, Jesus, Jesus, my whole trust is in thee. I know that no righteousness of my own can save me, but only thou, O Christ, sink or swim, I cast myself on thee. O my brother, thou art drawn by the Father, for thou couldst not have come unless he had drawn thee. Sweet thought. And if he has drawn thee, dost thou know what is this delightful inference? Let me repeat one text, and may this comfort thee. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Yes, my poor weeping brother, inasmuch as thou art now coming to Christ, God has drawn thee. And as much as he has drawn thee, it's a proof that he has loved thee from the foundation of the world. Let thy heart leap within thee. Thou art one of his. Thy name was written on the Savior's hand, and they were nailed to that accursed tree. Thy name glitters on the breastplate of the great high priest today. Aye, and it was there, but for the day star knew its place, or the planets ran their round. Rejoice in the Lord, ye that have come to Christ, and shout for joy, all ye that have been drawn by the Father. For this is your proof, your solemn testimony, that you from among men have been chosen to eternal election, that you should be kept by the power of God through faith unto the salvation ready to be revealed. End of the reading of Human Inability by Charles Spurgeon. 